Hi, my name is Jim and I'm a woodworker and a guitar builder. I'm on a mission to using my background in woodworking to start a business building high-end acoustic guitars. In today's video, I'm going to give you the current April 2024 shop tour. So this is not the first shop tour that we've had in this location. Um, I've done several over the years, but this is the most recent. This is April 2024 but this is probably gonna be the last shop tour you see in this location. And the reason for that is we've just really outgrown this space. So our shop is two stories and the exterior dimensions is about 24 by 24 feet. And that gives us a working space of about 20 by 20 downstairs and upstairs. We're gonna start out the tour today downstairs in the woodworking shop. So here's the entry door. This is the door we primarily use when we come into the shop. And the first thing you're gonna notice when you come in is this large workbench. And this workbench serves a lot of different purposes for us, but the main reason I built this bench was to use it as a clamping uh, bench. That's called, in the uh, guitar building business, it's called a go-bar deck. So this workbench, when I designed it, I made it to be eight foot long to allow us to be able to clamp up really like four guitars at a time in this bench, but I also made it a certain width on purpose. It's 36 inches wide. And what that does is it allows for us to be able to store most of our raw materials underneath the workbench. So this is an example of a acoustic guitar side that hasn't been thickened or bent yet. And it is a little bit less than 36 inches in length. And it fits under here really nicely to keep things organized. So I wanted to show you guys uh, how we clamp things on this workbench using these yard stakes. These are made to put in the snow and line your driveway with. They're made of fiberglass, but we put rubber tips on them and we can put braces and different parts on our guitar uh, sides and or our guitar backs and tops. And we can clamp it in like this. And I think originally, before there was fiberglass, people used like bamboo sticks and things like that. But now having these driveway sticks available, it makes a really good clamp uh, for this bench. But uh, we use a lot of these and we can actually put four guitars side by side. So we can have one here, 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 and here, and we can clamp all those up at the same time. In this corner of the shop, we also have our jet drill press. This is a 17 inch drill press. And truthfully, we don't use it a whole lot for the type of operations we do in the shop, but it is really important when we're drilling tuner holes in our guitar necks to get those holes just really clean and really square. So the drill press is primarily used for that. There is some other operations that we use it for like drilling um, bolt holes for our necks and some other things. But this is a really great drill press that I was able to get um, from a, I bought out a cabinet shop some years ago and this was part of that deal and um, it's a really great drill press. So moving on into the next corner of the shop, this is one area that we could definitely have more space. I'd love to be able to spread all these tools out some and make it a whole lot easier to use them. But we've got our small band saw with a quarter inch blade on it and we use that primarily for cutting uh, really tight radii and then we've got our bigger bandsaw or jet bandsaw that we use for doing resawing and also for uh, we, we use it a lot for cutting out our necks and different parts of the guitar also back here in the back is our one of our newer pieces of equipment it's not a new uh joiner but we added a joiner to the shop this past year and we use it for um, basically turning a big blocks of wood into our guitar necks and getting them nice and flat this joiner, I think, is close to 20 years old, but for us, it's a, a really great addition to the shop. So I want to talk real quick about this uh, combination uh, belt and disc sander. I did a review on this. It's maybe been five years ago now, and um, we use this thing absolutely every single day. And one cool thing is, is I've only had to change the paper on this maybe twice. So it really does last a long time, but it gives you the ability to get a really square uh, cut when you're sanding. And I mean, we literally use it for all sorts of different things. We shape our guitar braces with it. We make our bone nuts and saddles with it. We just use it, we use it almost constantly every day in the shop. So now we're looking at the Eastern uh, side of the wood shop here. 
And in the past, I made a lot of videos on French cleat tool walls, and perhaps as a woodworker, that was my one-time claim for fame. But we still do use some um, French cleats, but I have uh, cut back on some of the ones that I've used because what happens is with the French cleats is you build a fixture of some sort to hold your tools, and what happens is is one month later, you add another tool, and then you don't have space for it. So you're constantly having to update your fixturing to hold your tools because you keep adding tools and running out of space. So that's one disadvantage of the French cleat tool wall that I haven't talked about in the past. So I want to show you a couple uh, tools here that you have not seen before in any of our prior uh, shop tours. And the first one is this downdraft table. This is the uh, Grizzly downdraft table. And it's got a uh, fan inside of it and a filter. So as you're sanding the dust, um, most of the dust at least uh, gets uh, sucked down into the table into a filter. And of course, if there's any dust, if there's any dust on the outside of the uh, area around the fan, of course it blows it everywhere. But the way it's supposed to work is any of the dust that's getting created while you're sanding gets sucked in into the filter. So it, it does work pretty well for when you're sanding, but it doesn't work so well if you don't keep your shock. So I wanted to show you this light we made. And what this is, is this is a LED light that we basically built a little um, housing for and put a, put a switch on it. And, and it works really for a lot of different things. Like if we are if we're trying to get uh, two pieces of wood to have a perfect glue joint, we can hold it up to the light. And if there's any gap between the joint, you can see light through it. So that makes us, that means we need to work on it more before we glue it together. But another reason we use it is a common operation for instrument builders is to glue two thin pieces of wood together. And to do that, we have to get that joint as perfect as possible or we won't get good glue adhesion and potentially down the road that could split open. So we, we will we'll try to create a perfect joint by using the joiner and then some sanding blocks and then we'll bring it over and we'll sit it on the light like this and we'll look and see if we have any light coming through the joint. And if any light is coming through, that means we need to work on that more and get that and get that joint tighter. So this is a good example where there's quite a bit of light coming through and it needs a lot of work uh, before we could glue it together. Now this actually hasn't been jointed yet and it hasn't been sanded yet, but it's a good example of how we use that light. This is interesting, look, look at that one. It's got a little defect in it. You see that? Run through. Oh, there it is, look. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I can see it like clean as day in the light. Testing, testing. Okay, we good? I want to talk real quick about cabinetry in your shop. And this here is just a, um, a Yukon cabinet that I had bought it at Harbor Freight years ago. But one thing I've tried to do on our cabinets is I've tried to label them with stickers or pieces of tape and write on there what's in each drawer. And, and of course, part of that is so I know where to go to get whatever it is I need. But the other reason I do that is if you have, for example, on this drawer that says tape, you're probably not gonna put a bunch of other junk in that drawer that's not tape. And what happens is, and this is, the, this, is this drawer here is a good example, it just catches everything because it doesn't have, it doesn't have like a name on it. And this one down here is rasp, which we've done a pretty good job of keeping it just with rasp and files. But if you don't label it, you're gonna put a bunch of junk in there and it's all gonna pile up and then you can't find anything. So I wanna talk real quick about our workbenches. This is, uh, this is my Paul Sellers workbench that I built. Maybe, I don't know, it might have been the first project that I built on this channel. And we still use it every single day. And there's all sorts of comments when I built this thing about out of pine about how it's gonna get tore up and you should build out of hardwood. Well, I have never resurfaced this thing and it's been like eight years since I built it and we still use it every single day. So I wanted to take a minute and just talk about some of the vices we use in the shop. You just can't build stuff out of wood without a vise um, because you, you gotta have some way of holding the material when you're working with it with your two hands. And, and I'll put links to all this stuff. I'll put as many affiliate links in the description of the video as I can of all the tools. 
so that you can you can find them and, and read about the, the description of the tools. But we're still using the Wilton vise that I put on this um, Paul Sellers workbench originally. And we use it all the time for holding, especially really heavy stuff. But I wanted to talk a little bit about these carving vices. I think these are called carving vices, but we actually have two of them. And they're really nice because they, they're mounted to the top of the bench and it gets whatever you're working on up closer to your face and it's easier to see. And you can see like here for carving necks, we've made a jig that mounts in the carving vise where we can really get here, get up here and work on a neck closer up to us rather than bending down and doing so. But these vices are really nice because what you can do is you can turn them. You can rotate them like that and that gives you the ability uh, to get them in all sorts of different positions and um, just super helpful. I, I wish I could get more of them. They're just, they're really expensive. You can shop around sometimes and find different manufacturers of them and get deals on them. But uh, again, I'll put a link so you guys can look at those. I wanted to just mention real quick that I'm still using the, uh, the plain caddy here that I built here on YouTube many years ago. And I built this, this cabinet out of um, pallet wood and, and I made a, a series of videos about it and it, it was super popular. I just wanted to, to let you guys know we're still using it today. And um, all of these, these uh, round pieces of wood here they all represent a guitar that we built. And every time we build a guitar and cut out the sound hole of the guitar, it ends up up here. And, and we'll write on there like what, when we built it and what woods we used and so forth. But it just gives you an idea how many guitars we've built right there. This is a jig that I bought from Luther's Mercantile International years ago. Uh, actually, it may have been a part of the sponsored guitar video that I did um, back in 2020 and I'll put a link to that if you guys didn't see it but this is a, a plywood jig that is intended to be used to create the um, tenon and the mortise on our guitar necks and we've been using it now for five years and continue to do so I've had to remake the templates that um, the guide bearing of the router rides against but other than that we just continued to use it and I keep saying I'm going to build something better, but I just haven't come up with something better yet. I want to talk just a little bit about our drum sander. And if you're building guitars or really anything with thin pieces of wood and you need to uh, sand them nice and flat and thin, you pretty much either have to do it with a series of hand planes and um, sanding blocks or you have to have a drum sander. And we're fortunate to have this jet drum sander, which is, is fantastic. Um, I would love to have several of these so that I could put different grits on there. We've had this one currently loaded up with a 120 grit belt and we use it for thicknessing down our tops and backs and sides to uh, like a veneer thickness. But it would be super nice if you're, um, if you had the space and the money, you could have several of these these uh, drum sanders set up with different grits and you could leave them loaded up at each grid and then you could literally go 80, 120, um, maybe 180, something like that and it would really cut down on your sanding, especially your finished sanding to get all those scratch marks out. We don't, we do actually currently have this one attached to a dust collector. Um, I will say something about our dust collection system. I used to have a jet dust collector in our closet behind me and what happened was, is I've got all these four inch ducts connected to it and they just kept getting stopped up. We had way too much equipment on that dust collector and unfortunately it just, we just had to quit using it. Uh, hopefully in our new shop or when we have a new shop, we can set up our dust collection system where we have maybe one dust collector per wall. That way our piping doesn't get so long that it gets clogged up. I will say if you're going to put a dust collection system in your shop and you're going to run ducting to it, be sure you have clean outs ever so often so that you can get in there and clean them out. We don't have really any clean outs on ours and that was part of the problem. So this is a, this is a router table I built years ago and this houses a router and the table, we can pull the router up and use it. But on top of that, we built a secondary router system. And this is one that's 
used um, specifically for building guitars. And this is the way that we um, route the, the ledge on the edges of our guitars for binding. It's called the binding channels. And we're, we have different bearings and bits that we put into our router here. And then the guitar sits on this little carousel and we can run it through and get a really square channel. So this is this system I had bought from Luther's Mercantile International years ago. And unfortunately they've gone out of business so it's no longer available. But there is other manufacturers out there that sell something similar to this. So for this router setup, it works off of bearings. And I have lots of bearings here of varying diameters that mount to the router bit. And what that does is it creates different size, um, basically channels for our bindings. So I created this block and it basically allows us to determine which bearing we need to use on the bit based on the width of the channel we need to create. So um, this, each one of these represents a bearing. So when we decide on what we want to put in the channel, we'll bring it over to this block and figure out which bearing to get and then we'll load up our router with it. And then we store, we store our bearings in this little thing here and and it's easy just to come grab one. So this is one of the routers that we have that mounts to this uh, binding router system. And the way it works is you've got the bit and the bearing just mounts right on the bit. And then there's a little screw here that locks it in place. And what that does is it sets the width of the channel. So having multiple bearings allows us to cut uh, a large diff, um, large variety of channel widths. So I'm a little scared to take you in the closet because I haven't been in there today and it's a hot mess. But I do want to show you some things that we've done that I think is important if you're building guitars or maybe building something else and you just need a place to store different parts. So let me go in here and show you what things look like. So I wanted to show you guys in here. I, I went on Amazon and I found these bins and I've got these plastic bins of maybe two or three different widths and lengths and that's where we're storing our parts so this one for example has some of our small brace stock in it and as we make them we'll load them up into these bins and um, it kind of helps us stay organized this is some of the kerfing we use inside guitars and we've got these organized also by the the, the type we have so i'll put a link to these on amazon these are really nice it'd be really great to have sort of a big metal cabinet and you could have these bins lined up on there and then label them with what they're there for. That's my intention. I just don't have the space for it yet, but we're eventually going to have kind of a big cabinet and line those up, label them. Each different guitar we build will have it labeled with, with what parts are there. So just a really, these are great. If you have space for them in your shop, I'll put links to them. One more thing I wanted to mention while I'm in the closet is, and I talked about French cleats a few minutes ago, but we're, we are using French cleats in the closet here, and these are different jigs I've made for, for gluing up different parts, but I've got cleats on them, and we hang them here on the wall um, just to get them out of the way, and they're, they're a great use for the French cleat system because these things take up a lot of space in the shop if they're not on a wall, and another thing too is by having the cleat on the bottom and then having a, another cleat at the bottom, or having a cleat at the top and a cleat at the bottom, or at least a block at the bottom. It allows it to sit flat on a workbench. Um, and then you can hang it back on the wall when you're done. Real quick about this Win spindle sander. Now, this is definitely a consumer model product. It's not uh, intended to be an industrial product. I did a review on it years ago. I actually own three of them because I, li I like it so much. And we use this thing all the time and you can get replacement uh, sanding paper for it as well but we use it almost every day and the thing just keeps going i think i only paid maybe maybe 95 to 100 dollars for it a few years ago i'll put links for it so you can see it but and i'll link to the review we did of it as well if i can find it but this these things are really great for the money for sure so when you start your shop or maybe you already have a shop and you're trying to figure out how you want to sharpen your tools, you've got to come up with some system for it. And originally I was using diamond stones, which are fine, but they're very slow. And it takes a long time to really hone a chisel or a plane iron. Well, years ago, I'd made a video of this WorkSharp um, 
tool cabinet and WorkSharp was nice enough at that time to send me this sharpening system. And we're still using it today. We use it all the time. And I've got different discs loaded up with different grit paper. So like this one, for example, here has the um, P120 and P400 on it. And then the one that's loaded on here, I think is the thousand and maybe 2000, but we rarely have ever had to change the paper on these discs. The, the, the paper stuck to these glass discs and uh, just, just a great system. I, I would definitely recommend this system to anybody that's looking for a sharpening system for their shop. Um, I think for the money, there's not a better system out there. We're just about ready to head upstairs and show you the top floor. But I just wanted to mention real quick before we do that, we invested in some CNC technology um, last year and we're now able to create templates. And this is a template of one of our guitars. And what it does is it allows us to not only mark where the braces go um, to be glued onto the, the guitars, but it also helps us to um, mark out the outer dimensions when we're cutting our rough stock. And it also allows us to use some of these alignment pinholes to keep things lined up. So this was a huge, um, it, when, when we were able to start making these, it really changed our shop a lot. It, it made things a lot better and a lot more accurate. Okay, so now we're upstairs in the shop and I'm gonna give you sort of the tour of the upstairs. The upstairs of our shop is really intended for some of the assembly work, uh, the finish work, and um, definitely the final assembly of the guitars and the setup, putting the strings and the pins and tuners and all that stuff we definitely do up here. And we also store a lot of our parts and guitars up here. So we just got upstairs and I'm gonna show you these jigs that we made. These are for storing our guitar sides that we bent. And also, we also bend the wood bindings that go on the guitars. They're the, the protective and decorative edges of the guitar. But we can put them in these little jigs here and store them until they're ready to be used. I don't like bending something and then just laying it on a bench because it's gonna get broke or it's not gonna maintain its shape really well. So this holds its shape until it's time for them to be used. Another thing that we've done is we developed a system for keeping up with the parts for each guitar. So for example here, we've got a clipboard of cubby number five. And I'm gonna show you those cubbies here in just a minute. But in cubby number five, we've got the, um, the guitar with a, the serial number 2401015. It's a 2024 guitar, orchestra model, deluxe edition. So these clipboards allow us to keep up with the body, the neck, the nut, the saddle, the fretboard, all the things that goes with that guitar, as long as they stay in that cubby and we update this, these little charts as we build the guitar, it helps us stay organized. It also has a place on there for the client's name and the client's phone number in case we need to contact them during the build. But this is a system I, I developed just to keep up with things because originally when we started building, uh, parts were getting scattered all over the place and it's hard to keep up with everything. So here's cubby number five and I've got Rodon here ready for sealer. That's because this particular guitar is pretty much ready to go into the spray booth. But this is cubby number five and this has got the, the guitar I was just referring to on the clipboard. So it's got the Tor 5 Sitka spruce top with the walnut back and sides. And then it has a um, Honduran mahogany neck that's all one piece. And then it's got ebony um, fretboard and head plate and rear head plate veneer and all. So anyways, that's how we keep up with it. We've also put in these cubbies, these small little plastic bins. And the purpose of these bins is to keep up with the smaller parts. So like the nut, the saddle, um, the sticker that goes inside the guitar or um, any other small parts, like if, like if one of these is going to get uh, electronics in it, this would be a good place to store the electronics or the tuners until it's time for them. So this helps us stay organized and keep the parts all together so we don't mismatch them and, and lose them and so forth. So here in this storage cabinet we built, we've got room for, I think we've got 13 cubbies and some of these cubbies could, could hold actually two guitars like these bigger ones. But, um, 
as you can see, I've got a lot that need to be finished and most of these are about ready to go into the spray booth. And we're gonna, we're gonna show you the spray booth in a few minutes. So this is our fretting station. And I realized pretty quick when we started building guitars that we needed a dedicated space to do frets because number one, it makes a big mess. And number two, it, it does require some specialized equipment. So what I did was I, um, I bought a Harbor Freight Arbor Press and I had our local machine shop cut off the front of it so that we can uh, slide our necks underneath there and use it uh, to press in the frets. Um, it, I couldn't get an acoustic neck in there with the front on the arbor press. And then we built this little stand here that holds the neck while we're fretting it. You'll notice in the back here, we've got these magnetic um, clamps that we've got screwed to the wall. And if you've got a workshop and you don't have magnetic clamps, you're really missing out because they, they really are handy for tools that are able to stick to them. So you can see all of these tools are ones that are used primarily for fretting and we got them all in this one spot. So this is just a, a way that we organize the fret wire that goes into our necks. It comes in a big roll and then we'll cut it down into the, the proper size pieces and just store them in this little thing here until they're ready to be used. This is our bending station. This is where we steam bend our sides and create the shape of the guitar. And what we've done is we've created different size molds for whichever guitar body we're building. This one, for example, is our auditorium model. And these are, these are created on the CNC machine and then we put them together um, and put them inside this bender that I built. Really the heart of this machine are these Fox uh, press clamps and I'll put a link in the description so you can find them, but that's what drives the machine and presses everything together and holds it until um, it's steam bent. And then once it cools down to room temperature, it'll hold its shape. I'm using the Luther's Mercantile uh, heat controller, um, but uh, there's other companies in the market now that, that make those and you can get replacement blankets as well if you make yourself one of these machines. Our cutaway guitar model actually requires two different presses and that's what this arm here is for is it lifts up and it presses the cutaway into the guitar body which allows access to the upper fret registers. But so that, that one actually has two of the Fox press clamps on it. This workbench is where we do our vacuum clamping and vacuum clamping, um, we're using basically just a six mil bag that we made. We tape the edges and then, and I'll put, I'll put a link to where you can get these things because I can't remember where I got them now. But what it does is it, this seal allows you to connect your hoses to it. And then we've got a vacuum pump downstairs that sucks. Basically we would put this inside mold inside the bag and then put whatever we want to glue together. Like in this situation, we glue three pieces, three sides together to create a really rigid um, side of the guitar for our deluxe edition guitars. And so we'll put that inside the guitar and then put glue between the layers and then suck all the air out until the glue dries and you get like a really great uh, glue joint. But that's how we do that. We have this little um, male adapter and then the female adapter attaches to that. And um, the hose goes to our vacuum pump that's in the closet downstairs. So I've got another uh, storage cabinet here that we, this is where I oftentimes will put the strings and the tuners on our guitars. So I've got most of that equipment here in this cabinet. And I bought these little plastic uh, container cubbies just to kind of organize bolts and nuts and bridge pins and all that sort of stuff. And then right here behind, uh, we built this guitar case storage um, rack. And we, we used uh, the foam padding you put on your plumbing to keep it from freezing to pad it. And then we put rubber over it. And the rubber we're using is like what you would put inside of a cabinet to pad it or maybe on a workbench. We wrapped it so that we wouldn't uh, damage our guitar cases while they were waiting or they were waiting here. And um, so anyhow, these, these guitars here are currently for sale and they're just waiting, waiting here in our rack until they're sold. We built the rack where it has 
two levels so that we can get, I think we can probably get maybe, maybe six or eight guitars at the top and six or eight guitars at the bottom currently. Ideally in our next shop, we would have probably an entire wall designated for just guitar case storage and also finished guitar storage. So this is where we do a lot of our setup work. Uh, I usually use this workbench for gluing necks and bridges on guitars. We do a little bit of our finished work up here. Um, sometimes we'll do assembly like strings and tuners and that sort of thing. But we've got another row of magnetic strips that holds the tools that we commonly use in this area. We've also got some overflow storage up here um, just to keep things out of the floor and uh, some additional storage at the bottom. If you're still watching, you probably um, are interested in what we do and you probably also realize that building guitars is exceedingly expensive, not only in materials, but also in labor. And for that reason, we have created some different products that are on our website that are for sale. And for example, we have some really, really nice t-shirts that are currently on the website. And it says, it says that if you read, it says a guild of artisans striving to develop long lasting relationships with our clients, one handcrafted guitar at a time, lasting build luthery. And I'm wearing the shirt now as well. We created these shirts actually for a show we went to a couple weeks ago and we got quite a few left over. So if you're interested in buying one, we'll be happy to ship them to the continental US. And um, if you're overseas or something and you'd like to buy one, I'd have to figure out what the cost of shipment is. But uh, um, if you're interested in a shirt, uh, we've got a lot. We got, I think, four different colors. We've got charcoal, blue, uh, green, and we've also got a, a gray shirt. So um, if you're interested, they're on our website. We've also put on our website these fretboard keychains. And we make these right here in the shop. We actually made a bunch of these for a guitar show, and we have a lot left over. But these are made out of Indian rosewood with either mother of pearl or abalone shell dots. They have real fret wire and they even have a real leather strap. So if you're interested in those, they're on the website as well. And I can ship those to the continental US. Um, or if you're overseas, I'll have, to, I'll have to get you a price on shipment for that. Okay. So this is our buffing system that we're using. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. Our spray booth is just in this back area here. And you do not want your, your buffer close to your spray booth. And we learned that in retrospect, but we also don't really have anywhere to put it elsewhere at this current location. So, but this is the Stumac buffer and um, it's got two different buffing wheels. And this is what we will use to create that mirror polish on our guitars once they've gone through the finish process and the finish is cured and everything. So, um, but this is a really fantastic machine. It's got a lot of power. Other thing is you can see the wheels are nice and spread out. That way when you're buffing a guitar, you don't risk hitting like this part here. Um, and this system is really designed specifically for, for building guitars, but I can see that it could be used for lots of other areas of um, manufacturing as well. So the last thing I have to show you guys on this video is our spray booth. And we are currently spraying nitrous cellulose lacquer and um, we're probably only spraying maybe a gallon a month. So truly we probably could get away with just spraying it outside, but I felt like the right thing to do was to have the spray area segregated from the rest of the shop and to have the appropriate filters and everything. So we did build this um, booth area back here behind these plastic walls. And the way the system works is we've got a fan that blows a large volume of air out the window. And then there's a filter wall in front of the fan and then there's the segregated area here with, within the booth. And then we've got an intake filter here that filters any of the air going into the booth. So as the fan runs, it seals the door. And then that filtered air goes through this, uh, the, the, air, the air in the shop goes into the filter, into the, into the booth. That way we're not getting dust and everything on the guitars when we're spraying them. So come on inside and I'll show you the booth. So we're inside the spray booth and this is our filter wall. Um, I can't remember exactly. I think this is a four foot um, width booth. And it's about, uh, probably about seven foot high. It's got an LED light in it that's explosion proof, which is really important in a booth because it is, you're spraying combustible material. So you can't have lights in here that have the, 
potential to to spark. Um, so I'll hang the the guitar off of this chain here, then I can spray it here. Of course, the fan will be running. All of the um, solids from the spray, overspray would be collected into our um, filters here, and then the air goes out the, the window. I've also put uh, these hangers in here so that I can hang guitars while they're um, drying and curing and so forth. And I've got enough room in here right now for probably six or eight guitars to stay in here at a time. We're using the Fuji Q5 turbine system, and I've got a gravity feed gun, and um, that's what we're using to spray the nitro sailor's lacquer. This is my little mixing area. I've just got this little metal cabinet that I got at Harbor Freight, and um, I've got all my supplies here for mixing the lacquer. And then we can also add color to the lacquer if we want to, to, to for like sunburst or for coloring a neck or something. I don't really store much lacquer here. And we, truthfully, we don't spray very much lacquer. Like I said, we probably only spray maybe a gallon a month, but I, I, I just try to order about a gallon or two extra from what I would need for a given month. And the other thing we had to do before we could start spraying was create these little holders that holds the guitar um, while it's getting sprayed. And uh, like this one, for example, is made to fit into the body. And then we've got these here that are, um, Let's see, this one here, I made to create that, that actually goes into the neck. There's a, there's a bolt on the, or a, a threaded insert on the neck that this fits into, and then we can hang those up. This gives you an idea how the, the handle here mounts to a body. That's a Madagascar rosewood uh, cutaway body. And then this handle mounts to the neck um, like that. And then, so when I'm spraying, I can hold it like that and not have to touch it or anything. And then when I'm letting it cure and dry, I can just hang it up here like this. If you're using a turbine system, um, basically the way the turbine works is it blows warm air um, from the turbine through the hose into your gun. And you can, you can blow um, like the guitar off with it without spraying the lacquer. But in my opinion, it doesn't have enough airflow. So I like to, I went ahead and ran a hose up from our compressor so that we can blow like any dust off the guitars before we spray them. I didn't feel like the turbine had quite enough airflow or pressure to, to blow dust and things off. So if you're using a turbine, I'd recommend also having a compressed air system. That about concludes the shop tour. This is our main shop. This is where we're doing the majority of our building, but we have a secondary shop that we uh, call the CNC shop. And my dad actually runs that for us. And the next video, I'm gonna take you over there and show you our CNC machine and how we um, machine uh, parts over there. And also we make molds and templates and things like that. So if you're not subscribed, be sure you uh, do that. And if you haven't hit that notification bell, be sure you do that as well. So um, anyhow, thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate it. And um, if you're interested in a shirt or a keychain, that certainly helps us uh, uh, with the cost of building these really high-end guitars and also in an upcoming video We'll be showing you some finished instruments that we built and let you hear some of them as well So thanks again for watching and I'll see you on the next video leather um, What are those things called clips I guess <laughs> What is the thing <laughs> strap? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it again